morning, everybody. Morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, wonderful. All right. Uh, basically, some announcements uh, while we wait for people to come in. Uh, the quiz tomorrow, I figured out a way to do it. Basically, what I'll do is email it to you in an email format, HTML, uh, so it's all formatted and such like that. And you just uh, type in your answers, type in your answers where you can type in the blanks or the space between the questions. And then you take a picture of your uh, calculations page and email that back to me along with the, the finished quiz at uh, 9.50 tomorrow at the end of the quiz time. So basically they'll be timed regarding when you get the email and then when you finish, it'll be about 9.50. And basically that'll solve the problem for people that can't write on the screen or other things because you can just type in the email and just write it down on your scratch paper, the, the, the work in your own handwriting and attach a picture from your cell phone. Uh, does that sound reasonable to everybody? If we have an iPad, can we still like write on the screen or do you still want us to? Uh, okay. Of, of course. But basically, it, this will just make it easier, and I'll include a PDF of it too. But I'll, I'll do it both ways, so you can you can uh, use the iPad and write on the iPad too. That'll work fine. So we just email it back right at nine fifty when we're done, and I'm not going to accept it past the ten o'clock tomorrow. Does what, that sound? Huh? What time will you be sending it out? How long will we have? At about nine o'clock. I'll announce okay. it. We'll start the meeting. I'll announce it, and then I'll click push. Uh, send and then you can start and then when you're done you just uh, send it back to me with an attachment with your scratch paper writing on it and you can use the standard periodic table I will attach that well you can download and print that out first or you can use your standard periodic table that you have on your paper but you'll be on your honor to use your calculator only and the cell phone to take a picture at the end uh, and please don't, I, I know some of you might be tempted to cheat, but I don't think you will, but please don't. The whole purpose of a quiz is to help you get ready for the test, just a way to see what you know and what you don't. And then I'll uh, grade them tomorrow and then email them back to you. The, 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 uh, the, uh, your quiz, just send it back to you and kind of make little comments and then uh, give you the grade but uh, it'll only be worth 50 points or something like that. So, it, but it's just going towards the quiz grade. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes, and I have one more question. Are we sure. expected to be on a Zoom, on the Zoom call while we're taking the quiz or is this just something we'll do on our own and then send it to no, you? No, you just do it on your own. Just do it on your okay. own. I, I don't care. I, people are gonna be in their beds. If, you're, if someone's sick, they might be in their pajamas. I'm not gonna fuss about that, but just use your desk and write out the write out your work and then take a picture of it at the end and type in your answers if you need to type it in the email if you want to write it in with a pdf uh that would be great too uh whichever way works for you okay any any questions about that before i finish but basically what i'm going to do today is essentially finish chapter six and then uh, we'll move on to chapter seven um, and uh, and then we will include uh, seven is also rather short and basically the exam will be five, six, and seven, um, five, six, and seven uh, on the exam for uh, the, the uh, and that'll happen probably the end of next week or, or maybe on Monday after, after that with a little overlap of, of lecture material, okay? And Douglas, excuse me. Um, the quiz is it's on chapter five. The, no, the quiz will be on chapter six. Oh, okay. <laughs> Essentially, five and six, sort of, but basically, but mainly electron configurations and other stuff like that, as well as the periodic trends and other stuff that I'm going to finish off today. Okay. We're not, we're not going to do Lewis dot structures, which comes up next, but that's going to be in the exam. I have another question. 
Sure. Um, is it due 9, uh, 950 or 10? Well, the deadline is 950, but I'll give people till 10 o'clock because of problems regarding taking the picture or whatever else. Okay. I, I, I'm not going to be a stickler about it, but I'm not going to accept it past 10 o'clock. I'll, I'll see the time stamp on your reply email. But uh, but basically, I, there may be a penalty if it's five or ten minutes late. But I I want it back by ten o'clock. Okay. And any other questions? Okay, so let let's t continue where we left off last time, and uh, basically, uh, what I'm going to do now is essentially continue. look at the rest of the stuff for chapter seven. We were talking about the electronic structure of atoms at the end. Uh, okay, I, I covered that there in, in Chang. So now I'm gonna open up the other one. Okay. Now, uh, essentially, we've got a, another set of slides here, and and uh, some will be some will be essentially continuing where you left off. But what I want to do is kind of refresh you regarding the uh, ionic radius and such like that. What we were talking about before, and ask some basic questions of you, kind of illustrating, uh, kind of having an overlap as to where we were before with this. So let me share the screen with you now. Um, also, those of you that did not turn in the lab exercise for at the atomic structure, please make sure it's turned in today, just so you can get some credit for it. Uh, I, I'm referring to particularly the uh, the particularly the the part of the um, thing. Can everybody see the screen there with this? I'm going to start the picture. Can everybody see that now? Yes. Yes. Douglas, um, yes. What's the lab exercise for atomic structure? No, the atomic spectrum of hydrogen. Oh, okay. That I was due last Friday. A, a few okay. students didn't get it into me, and I just want to get it in so you can at least get the practice because that's going to be on the exam. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, all right. So let's so let's continue. What we're talking about atomic radii with ionic radii, and let me continue with the next one. And I'm going to ask you a basic question here. Um, why, why does the lithium atom, why does the lithium atom here decrease in size so big, uh, from being so big on the left over here? Why does it decrease in size and why does the fluorine get bigger? Loses an electron? Yes, it's a shifting of electron. There's one electron in here that essentially goes over to there. And essentially now the, the lithium is now uh, sm much smaller because of the positive center pulling all the electrons in the center closer. And then the extra electron fills out another shell. So essentially there's a transfer of electron from one side to the other. The cation is always smaller than an atom from which it's formed. And the reason for that is because of the positive nature of the nucleus, okay? So please understanding is one of attraction. If you've got more positive in the center uh, than you do around the negative around it, it'll make it a smaller ball, okay? Now, the anion is always larger, why? Is it because when it gains an electron, um, it the protons and electrons repel each other more? Right. And, and, and band? And, and there aren't as many protons holding it in place. So basically, it will go into an outer shell when it adds an electron. Correct. Very good. OK. Or, or it'll fill it off. But the point is, it'll expand because it fills it up more efficiently. And the, 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 there's less charge in the center for the protons than there is for the electrons. So they'll, they'll be in a greater area. They're less constrained, in other words. It's a probability in the sense of um, them being bigger, okay? Now the radius ion PPM of ions and familiar elements, uh, don't worry about the numbers here. I just want you to see the trends. 
why do the ions, when you go to this, why do they get smaller? And why do they get smaller here? They're losing electrons. Yeah, and and they're gaining protons too. So you've got two things. You, you're going up on the periodic table regarding number of protons and you're losing electrons as well, okay? Now, <coughs> the thing that's interesting in here, there's a bunch of different samples and these are the transition metals, but notice they're all about the, the same size. These are about the same size. Why do you think that is? That they're approximately the same size. What, why do you suppose that is? Which orbitals are they filling in the transition metals? The D ones, yes, yeah, very good. So they're essentially packing in there. And the same thing with the F. If you were to put the size of the F in there, it's even more efficient and has to do with just with efficiency in uh, filling up the space, okay? So the more efficient, the more things in there, the tighter the ball will be. Because remember, even the electrons, they go through mostly empty space. So there's plenty of room for them when it's in a very efficient setting, okay? Now, uh, the ionization energy is the next step. And basically, this is the energy required, the minimum energy required to remove an electron from a gaseous atom in its ground state. Now, suppose you're looking at two little kids playing and one, one kid wants to keep a ball and the other one wants to take it from him. What's the minimum energy required to do it? If you got two kids playing with the ball, one ball, and one kid wants to take it from him, what's the minimum energy required to do it? Well, it's the strength of the boy, that wants, uh, the boy or child that wants to take the ball from the other one, okay? Or he could just ask them, and sometimes they want to give it up. Like, say, for example, the lithium wants to give up the extra electron, okay? So when you're going from lithium, to lithium plus one, it gives it up happily. Why? Why does it give it up happily or easily? Because it wants to become a noble gas and it's right. one electron very electron good. Very good, very good. So essentially there's like an exchange between the different things to form the fluorine. Now fluorine, gains electron, it just asks nicely and gets the fluorine. So basically it happily takes it, takes it. Now they're both happy because they're both pretending to be noble, okay? So basically there's a meaningful exchange that happens between both. And uh, in some respects, it's, it's kind of amazing for me, this, the fact that it works out, that it works out so well, supposedly this. So now let's look at the specifics regarding that. Now, the ionization energy is the amount of energy in kilojoules per mole required to do it. It's like the pulling strength required to pull on that extra electron. And it particularly works when it's very happy to give it up. And so, for example, if you have lithium, lithium going to this, going to lithium plus one plus electron, there's the amount of energy required to do it energy is put into the system and it grabs it away and then this electron is separated from it. This is called the first ionization energy. But if you have calcium, basically this can go from calcium, it'll give up two of them. So it'll go to plus one first, plus one electron. Then it'll go to calcium plus two, plus two electrons. And, and that is called uh, another electron there. And essentially that would be the second ionization energy. So sometimes there's a first and a second associated with this. Okay. So, so what do you think is a lower number, the first ionization energy or the second? Hmm. 
What's a lower number? The first ionization energy, the second. Be logical. Is it the first one because it's just a one? Got the sure. Sure, yeah. So for a calcium atom to give up one, it's easy to take the one to one. Then the second is a little harder because there's a more positive center in the center and, and there's a shortage of electrons already. So it gives up another one. But this is also a noble gas thing too. This is also noble in its electron configuration, electron configuration. So it's happy to do it. It just takes a little bit more energy to grab it away. Okay, and then sometimes you can have a third ionization energy. For example, with aluminum, aluminum will go to aluminum plus one, and then aluminum plus two, and then aluminum plus three. And the one that's plus three will be a little higher there, and that's called the third ionization energy. So basically, to take extra electrons from a more positive center is a little bit more difficult. But when you look at all the numbers, the aluminum still likes to be plus three because it's still pretending to be that noble gas or that noble formation, okay? Just like the other ones, okay? So the, the lowest ionization energy is the first one, then the second, then the third. And if you look at these numbers, you can see that. So let's look at, uh, let's look at lithium. Go, it's very easy, it's 520. Why is it 7,300 for the second one? Notice it goes from 520 to 7,300. Why is it 7,300 for the second one? Hey, Professor Douglas. Yeah. Can you go back to the previous slide for one second? Yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, now why is the second one much easier than the first? Why is the second one much harder? Why is the gap so large between 520 and 7300? <coughs> well, because basically this is the noble gas form. This is the noble one now but then you're breaking into the breaking into the lower orbitals into the p orbitals below it orbitals below in other words you're trying to break the billiard ball and basically that energy is required if you look at beryllium you notice the 899 and then 1757 and this is a big gap too then boron notice the differences in them okay boron it goes from 3,600 to 25,000. Then carbon goes from there. Then if you looked at nitrogen, there's not that much a difference there for that. But nitrogen goes a, li a little uh, further. Right? Dr. Douglas? Yes. Um, could you explain again why the second ionization energy is bigger than the first? Well, I'm because still confused. The, the, uh, the center is more positive, remember? With the lithium plus one, how many electrons are, look on your periodic table, how many electrons are there? At a normal without ionization? Yes. How, Three. how many electrons? Three. Three, okay. Three electrons. How many protons? Three. Three, okay. So when you take one away, there's three protons and two electrons, right? Right. So why is it so hard to go to three protons? three protons plus one electron. Why would that be more difficult? This huge gap here. Um, because you're going past the first shell. Yeah, you're breaking into this 1s2 orbital and it doesn't want to do that. Yeah. I, get, I get that part when you go past the noble gas, but like for beryllium, why is it harder to go? Because with beryllium, how many protons do you have? Uh, four. Four. So basically with beryllium, you have four protons, and so there are four electrons, but then you take one away, there'll be three, but that's coming out, that's coming out of the 2s1 thing, correct? 
that's in the uh, the other shell. It's not full. Okay. So it's getting rid of that, and then you take that one away, then it's down to 1s2 again, which is stable. And so that's why beryllium is naturally plus two. But going all the way down the same way is much harder. Okay. <clears throat> Can you explain how you get these specific numbers though? Like why is it well, being- they, they calculate experimentally. They did experiments for this. <laughs> It's kind of amazing, but a lot of chemists and physicists did this years, decades ago and got Nobel Prizes for it. Okay, so do we just have to know it basically? No, you don't memorize the numbers. I just want you to see the trends. Okay. So, so just looking at this thing, why is it more difficult to take, to take electrons away as you move across the periodic table? As you move across, why is it more difficult? Well, same thing, because you're getting more protons, but basically there's, there's gaps regarding taking them away. Okay? But how do you know, like, how much it's going to go up? Like, how do you, can you just go over how you work that out again? The numbers? Yeah. Well, they, they, they do that experimentally. They determine experimentally, but if you go back on the thing here regarding ionization energy, like, say, for lithium, Lithium is going from 1s2 to 2s1, correct? Mm -hmm. Going to lithium plus one, which is 1s2. This is full, this is helium, correct? You see that? Okay, so on the quiz, we're gonna have to answer like this. We're not gonna have to answer like the specific numbers. Well, what I want you to understand on the quiz is that. Why does it get smaller as it goes across? And, you, and you'll get it. It's just a matter of doing the reading too, okay? So just don't forget to read the chapter. Okay. And look at those things. E e even Hein has some things in this, but this is a little bit more than introductory chemistry. What chapter is what? this? I believe it's in chapter 11 of Hein, but our, it, it's in chapter six of our textbook. Okay, thank you. Okay. Why did you say it gets smaller? Sorry? Why did you say it gets smaller? Well, because there are more protons in the center than there are electrons, and so it grabs it closer to it. it the more positive center attracts the electrons in a tighter ball. It's like, it's like a kid that has 10 toys and one was taken from him. How much more likely is he want to keep the other nine? But you keep saying, the uh, numbers are getting higher though, and you're saying it's getting lower, so it's just kind of confusing. I don't know. Well, well, well they go lower as you go down the periodic. Uh, they go lower over here. They're lower over here to get the first one away than the second. But as you go down the periodic table, like say, look at how easy it is to get a potassium to be potassium plus one. Yes, sir. Okay, that's, that's lower than lithium. Why? Well, where is it on the, where is potassium on the periodic table? What row, what, what shell is it? Um. See, see this is N equals two here, right? For lithium and then sodium is N equals three and potassium is all the way down here to N equals four, okay? It's on the fourth shell. So it's further away anyway. So it's easier to take away the first electron. Okay, so the further the shell, the easier it is. Yeah, and it's just like someone holding the toys out further. It's easy to take away from them. So they hold them together to your chest or something. Okay. Okay, I, I, I kind of illustrate that in, in the class when I'm doing it in person. People usually smile or whatever at it, but it's kind of goofy, but it kind of explains the point. It, the further away you hold an object from yourself, the easier it is to take away from you. Okay, just because of practicality reasons. But that's the same thing with electrons. They're easier to take away the first time. Okay, and, and it, 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 it's, it, it's a trend that's kind of designed that way. Now the variation of the first ion, ionic energy with atomic thing is, as you notice, it goes up and up. The lowest one here, look, look on the thing, cesium is the lowest. Why do you suppose cesium is, so, is the lowest, why? Where is it on the periodic table? 
Is it because it has six um, outer shells, so it's further yeah. away? From yeah, this? very good. It's all the way down at the bottom. Yeah. So basically, it's the furthest out, so it's easy just to take one electron. And cesium will also be plus one. Okay. So basically, these are all filled shells at the top. When you get the filled show, then it becomes really easy to do the other ones. But, the, but as you go up, this is adding protons. This is more protons as you go this way, correct? More protons, more protons. So basically, it makes it a little bit more difficult to take an extra electron away as you go there. So that's called a periodic trend. Now, the general trends in first ionization energy, if you look at this, the increasing first ionization energy, it goes up that way and then goes to the right. This is because there's more protons. And this one is because it's closer to the nucleus. So closer to the nucleus, it's tighter. It's a tighter bond whereas more protons also makes a tighter bond. So wait, can you go back for one second? So like 8A, the first one in 8A would be the highest basically? Yeah, because this and is- like the bottom of 1A would be the lowest? Yeah, these are full, these are full. They don't wanna give up electrons at all, okay? But these ones are easy to give up electrons. These will all be X plus one. This will be X plus two, okay? So a higher ionization energy means it's harder to break off an electron. Correct. Okay. Yes. And, and it'll get higher as you go across the periodic table because there are more protons holding everything in going across. Then you go, then you bounce up to the next shell, which makes it easier going down. Okay, so it's easier for the first light. Correct. Okay. Now the reverse of that is called electron affinity. I'm this sorry, Dr. Douglas, will you go back for two seconds? Sure. Okay, thank you. The reverse of that is electron affinity, which is the negative of the energy change that occurs when it's accepted by an atom. So if we take fluorine, it'll gain an electron. Okay, plus energy, uh, sorry, it gains electron. E will come from, from the lithium. This is from lithium, say, from lithium. Okay, the E there, and, and essentially the negative of the interchange that occurs when it's accepted. So basically this gives off energy. So you get energy from this going off. So it's like the fluorine grabs it and gives off energy and the whole thing collapses. Uh, the, uh, the fluorine is happy again because it now has a noble gas configuration and there's less tight energy in the system and it becomes a bigger ball so to speak, and that's, that's electron affinity, or the tendency of electron to draw electrons to itself uh, is, is another way to describe it. But again, I'm gonna clean up the slide. Okay, so if this is the opposite, is it easier yes. for the noble gases to give them away? Well, like say, for example, fluorine will gradually go to fluorine, uh, sorry, minus one, and oxygen will go to oxygen minus two, and that's called the that's the reverse of taking it away. That's called electron affinity. In other words, it gives off energy when that occurs, and, and that's where you have an energy exchange regarding taking electrons gives it energy. Uh, sorry, requires energy, but giving uh, getting an electron gives it up because the electron goes from being separate from it to being in orbit around that ion, uh, around that center, nucleus, filling up the thing. So essentially, these are both noble gas configurations. These are both pretending to be neon, correct? So they basically have less energy overall because they've given up some energy because they accepted the electron. So basically, the definition of electron affinity is giving up electrons will release energy. Right. That's the negative of the energy change, yes. That's accepted by the atom. With the, the lithium, it, it, it's the energy required. If we were to go back on that to describe the ionization energy, minimum energy required to remove an electron. This is removed, okay? 
Then you go back to the other side again, go back to the other slide, and that's the negative when it's accepted. So essentially, this is the energy that it gives off when it's accepted. So basically, it accepts the electron there, and fluorine gains the electron, and this is called negative 328 kilojoules per mole. Whereas if you had the lithium from the previous slide, if you look at lithium, that's 520, positive 520. So basically the, the lithium to get up the electron goes to lithium plus one plus the electron this delta H, and we'll talk about delta H in, in the last part of the semester. This is plus 520. So this requires energy, kilojoules per mole. Requires energy. This is gives up. Okay. Do you see the relationship there? Um, for electron aff affinity, which side would the energy be added to, the products or reactants? Well, in, in the case of electron affinity, when it's given off, if you were to set it up that way, it'd go, uh, it would go like this, uh, plus an electron would go to fluorine and then plus energy. Okay. Like okay, thank but you. It's given off. But when you're doing it the other way with this, energy is required on this. It's like the energy required to grab a toy from someone, uh, from a kid or something, <laughs> or from a friend. The energy here, you put it in and that grabs the electron away. So they're on different side of the equation. And we'll get into that when we get into energy in chapter nine or 10 or whatever it is, okay? The book is weird and going that way. Uh, normally the way I teach this is I would have already talked about Delta H and other things like that, but um, the department decided to do it following this book order, which is fine, but it's just, you, you got to take my word for it a little more, that's all. <laughs> and so basically here, let me delete what's on the slide, it's, it's all on the Zoom so you'll see it, but the energy, the E, the energy there accepted is, is 328 kilojoules per mole. That's what the electron affinity is the positive of that. Um, that's the positive value. And oxygen, when it gains electrons there, that, that uh, basically it gives off this amount of energy. This is the amount of energy that's given off and that's given the positive value. That's called the electron affinity of that. Okay, now electron affinity, as you go down there, basically you notice they will also have trends, but, uh, but basically um, I, I, you don't have to worry about the table there, but basically the affinity, the ease of them getting it, this has to do with all going to F minus or chloride minus and this bromide minus one, et cetera, sorry, minus one, going there, let me delete what's on the slide. But here you've got these things going again with this, F minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one there. And diagonal relationships are related to this and basically uh, you don't have to worry about this slide. This is kind of, um, it, it, it's, it's more related to as you go higher on this relationship when you have the second the second row, um, this is n equals two and n equals one. Um, basically, you're going to the, uh, sorry, n equals two and three, I mean, you're going to the larger shell above that. And basically group one A elements are in here. You have the, all those and these all form compounds with plus one because they all have the NS1 thing and the NS1 essentially goes away to form the noble gas underneath it plus the extra electron on the group 1A elements. So they will form plus one there. And so the, uh, the chemistry is similar. 
So when you have lithium plus some reactant and sodium plus reactant, which which one will be uh, which one will be easier to perform? Or cesium plus the reactant, which one will be easier to perform? Wouldn't it be cesium because it's got correct? Yes, because it's bigger and it wants to give up that electron because they're all going to form CS plus one here, and when it's a higher thing there. But the thing that's interesting is they all form similar compounds. Like, uh, for example, lithium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide, they're all strong bases, okay? And they're very similar in their chemical reactivities going all the way down the periodic table. Dr. Douglas, I got kind of lost. We're no longer on electron affinity, are we? No, we're talking about now uh, the elements, the elements and the, and the groups, how their chemistry is similar. We've switched topics. Okay, I just, I, I'm sorry, I guess I must have. But the electron affinity is involved because that has to do with why all these, the fluorine, all going down here are also similar. We'll get to that. Okay, that's the electron affinity part because they all want to form minus one. These are all X minus one here, minus one, minus two, minus three. So they'll be similar as you go down two. So silicon dioxide is very similar to carbon dioxide because they're all in, they're all in the, uh, they're all in the, the column four, okay? Because carbon's here, silicon's here. We'll talk, we'll talk about that. I'll get rid of the extra noise on the slide again. Okay, but the reactions, look for example here, the reactions with water to form sodium hydroxide. Here, they react with oxygen to form this kind of thing. And it doesn't matter whether it's sodium, potassium, lithium, or any other one going down. They're all say, form the same compounds. And that's similar in reactivity with oxygen and water. So that's why the periodic table set up the way it is with everything lined up at the certain things. Okay, and that's what's neat about the standard periodic table I've been teaching you how to use. So if you look at that, now look at the group one elements, and this is what we're gonna kind of be doing next week with the lab, because basically with the lab, we're gonna be doing the experimental portion with the um, one A elements, the metals, and the demo that you looked at this week was essentially looking at the reactions of the nonmetals, which is the other side of that. And basically, if you look at these, they all say for the same way, and beryllium plus water, no reaction for that one. Beryllium is very happy being 1s2, 2s2. It doesn't easily want to react with water to do that, but magnesium will react with water under certain circumstances as a gas when it's heated up, but it, but it does react. It just take, it takes certain circumstances to do that. And then some other ones, calcium, barium, strontium, will also form the same kind of compounds. But the key thing with this is when they all react, they form the same compounds associated with this, whether it be whatever, these will form all calcium hydroxides when you react with it. And essentially going down, they're all similar chemistry. Similar chemistry as you go down. Okay, and so basically, and these are examples of the 2A metals there. And then going down there, the boron, aluminum, gallium, they all react similarly too. And these are the group 3A elements. And then group 4A elements that have NS2 and P2, and they will react with hydrogen similar ways, um, like tin and lead. And then these are examples of them. And then down there, now on YouTube, there's a whole lot of videos that go into this demonstrating how these all are reactive in similar ways. And when they react with water, 
separate compounds will form different things, but that's a little more complicated. But I don't really stress this much on the uh, elemental forms. I just ask my students to read this section carefully because it's interesting and, and, and uh, lots of videos online about them, the different elements. And then uh, there's some cool videos online that kind of describe them. And then this is the reactions of the halogens, which is related to the nonmetals. Uh, the previous one is related to nonmetals too, the nonmetals here, and, and then here as well. And, and then lastly, the noble gases with a complete, and they don't normally get extra electrons. They, they are full or want to give them up. And then there's special compounds of noble gases. So comparisons of the group 1A and group 1B, there are similar out, outer things there, um, and that's a little more complex, and I just like you to read that section for yourself, essentially. But the, the last part of this chapter is, is just more instructive, and I just want you to understand the trends. Uh, as you go across the periodic table here, um, different oxides related to this, and all this chemistry is covered in a course called inorganic chemistry. And that would be for those of you who are gonna be chemistry majors or are chemistry majors. This is where it gets into the chemistry of, of inorg inorganic oxides and such. But um, again, just I just want you to read it. And then the discovery of the noble gas is there. Okay, so essentially we are done with that share and what I'm going to do now is go to the other PowerPoint. Um, so I have a question. Sure. Um, could you just show us like an example of like how would you, um, sorry, how you would ask us a question on the quiz tomorrow? Well, that's the point of a quiz to help you understand what's done for the test. I, I just like you to work some homework problems in the back of the chapter. That'll be, that'll be illustrative enough. Is, is that, answer your question sort of? <laughs> yeah, it does. I, I don't want to dismiss you, it's important, but the point is there is this kind of fits, fits in that with this. Okay, now here, the electron affinity, um, there's some rules that's important in this, in this thing. I'm gonna open these up now and talk about different things that were addressed in the other slides and we'll finish off the lecture. Now, I'm gonna share this screen with you now with the other one. I have a question. Sure. Um, what chapter do you want us to work the homework problems? Chapter six. Okay. And and basically that'll be uh, what I'll be on the quiz. Now there's a couple of rules that I addressed a little bit. One of them is called the octet rule, and the octet rule is essentially when they want to. Uh, they want to, sorry, they want to be, pretend to be noble. In other words, you want to have NS2NP6. What does oct mean? Eight. eight electrons, very good. Okay, so there are eight electrons in what are called the valence electrons. These are the ones involved in bonding. The valence electrons are the ones involved in bonding. Very, very important to understand that. And Does that I, apply to um, like elements with only one electron, like hydrogen? Like how would they how would they reach eight electrons? Well, with hydrogen, hydrogen it will form a minus one. What's it doing there? Um, It'll go to one s two. Okay, so it's full. That's what's called for like sodium hydride, which is like this. That's okay, so the octet rule wouldn't really apply to. Well, it sort of does because it's still an out. It's still a full shell, but it's only two electrons. The okay. eight starts at the next row, but okay, the hydrogen kind of fits because the point of the octet rule is to say it gets a noble gas configuration, and this is the same configuration as helium. It's just uh, it, it's just a larger atom. Th this is larger compared to the helium because the helium has two protons, whereas the hydrogen has just one proton. 
one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And now uh, metals tend to have low, low, um, lose one or more electrons. That's why they conduct electricity. Okay. Isn't that logical? Why do nonmetals tend to not conduct electricity? Why? Just by this slide, why do nonmetals not conduct electricity? Because they're gases? No, sulfur is, a, sulfur is a solid. Well, it, it, it won't because essentially it wants to gain electrons and basically it acts as an electron magnet. In other words, they, they want to gain electrons to go to, like sulfur will go to minus two, oxygen will go to minus two. They want to get noble gases by adding electrons. So there's not extra electrons flowing around in the outer shells available to give up. So they don't conduct electricity like a metal would. What is the um, EAA and EI? Uh, well, that's just the, the activation. That's the ionization energy and electron affinity. Okay. Okay. Now, this is the next part about forming of ionic bonds. When you have the sodium, and I kind of alluded to it a little bit, and Chang, he gets about this in the next pack, in the next chapter. That's why I want to include the next chapter in, uh, in the next chapter, which is chapter seven in our test, because it fits very well with this. Because this, this one now, see, this is noble here, and this is noble. And essentially, ionic bond happens because of the exchange of electrons. That's why I was saying, uh, of electrons. Say, say two kids have uh, two kids have two toys. How can they both have two? How, how can both of the kids be happy? Say there's a, a brother and sister. The, the 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 brother is four and the sister is three. And, and they each have a toy. How can they both be happy sometimes? They share the same amount of toys? Yeah, but sometimes the brother, the four-year-old brother might give a toy to the sister because she'll be happy with two and he's outgrown the other one. So he doesn't mind giving it up. Okay? So it's like, with the sodium, it has an extra electron, right? And it wants to give it up to the chlorine, which wants an extra electron. That electron has moved from that place to that place. So essentially, you have the 3s1, 3s1 that was here, went over to fill up there, okay? So now, these are both noble gas configurations. And that happened by the exchange of electrons. That is, that is the exchange of electrons there. Okay, if we look at the next slide, it talks about the born hybrid cycle, but I don't want to get into that. But because um, we haven't gotten to that chapter, um, that chapter is chapter nine. But I just want to illustrate you to bring up what we're going to talk about on Monday with uh, bonding. So I'm kind of introducing bonding to you. So the, the first kind of bonding are what are called ionic bonds. And that's where you have an X plus one and a Y minus one. And basically it could be, or it could be X plus two and Y minus two. That's called ionic bond because they've given up electrons from one to the other. Okay, so we are done chapter six. Any, any final questions? I think our timing's been good today. Um, for the quiz tomorrow, did you say we have to get on Zoom or no? Well, well, I'm just going to be starting it on Zoom, and then, then at about 9.02, I will email it to everybody. Okay, so get on Zoom, but we don't have to stay on Zoom? No, I'll just, uh, I'll just make some announcements. I, I just want to sort of take attendance to see who's there, and then I'll push the button to send it, 
and then uh, you'll do the thing and then email it back to me when you're done. And the okay. deadline will be 10 o'clock. Okay. Okay, but officially it ends at 9.50, but it'll be 10 o'clock. In a way, this is perfect timing for the next quiz, okay? All right, any other questions? Because I, I, I'm done with the screen now. Uh, any other questions for those of you who are still here? Okay, well, have a good day, everyone.